pushed out a new version, the caches stay warm, the apps stay running. Do you get any kind of warnings that your code is about to be shut down or anything like that? Not really. This is kind of the, the price you pay for the free here, is that you're kind of living on some borrowed resources that can be taken away as soon as you're not using them. Um, so that's really the only downside to that. How does this work with uh, persistent storage? So, I think, yeah, you can, on the free tier, you can get access to a few different databases. You don't get access to a file system, so that's kind of a catch. <coughs> Excuse me. So you can get like a MySQL database, or you can get a MongoDB, and that data will stick around. And there's limits on that too. Like there's a whole chart of the data limits. Like I think it, they're fairly small. Like I think you might get 100 megabytes of space for a MySQL database, which is not great if you're trying to do something that's, I guess, not hobby usage. Or if you're trying to do something that's hobby usage that actually does use a lot of data. So there are some limits there too. Um, does like, Heroku, it's free. Does Heroku let you like VNC into the web server that you're getting? No. Just, it's... So that's the other interesting thing about Heroku is it's uh, it's what's called a platform as a service. It's not like uh, uh, it's not a, a plain ver vanilla virtual machine. Like you can't just jump in and have a shell and have a desktop or whatever you want. What you get are highly abstracted kind of server resource units. So you'll get like a server resource unit that runs your node Python app. And then you'll get another kind of Lego-like unit that runs the database. You can connect them together. Um, and you can get like a load balancer. So you get lots of little like Lego parts that are fairly uh, opaque. You can't log into them. You can't do anything with them other than start them up or shut them down. Uh, but it simplifies a lot. Uh, I was going to say, using the, the Heroku tool set that you can download from them, you actually can kind of, kind of console in what commands against the individual okay. dynamos. Um, I've, I've deployed some Rails apps to them, and you can end up running uh, you know, right commands against your your uh, Heroku stuff. But it's you're definitely not getting a good way. You're not even getting a full console. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds familiar too. So it's, you've got a little keyhole into running arbitrary commands, but for the most part it's an, it's an abstracted kind of black box. That you, have, you can't do quite as much as you'd like. Um, but if you do fit their patterns, it's a pretty cool service. Because you get, when you go from the free as in beer tier, you can, there are literally sliders you can slide on the web page to turn up the number of computers you have available, turn up the number of databases. And that kind of opaque abstraction lets them do that. It's kind of it's kind of you know the contract between it and your code, but they do it in a pretty standard way, so that again, you're not writing weird code necessarily to, to work with their thing. You could move this all to your own server, and you've preserved your ownership and visibility. And then the the last kind of good cloud service I want to talk about really quick is this thing called Cloud9. And what's kind of neat, the first time I saw this thing, I was like, oh, this seems kind of gimmicky, but I've used it a little bit since, and I kind of like it. It's an IDE, which is an integrated development environment, in a web browser. And so you've got a file system in the, in the cloud, you've got text editor panes, you've got a bunch of other interesting tools that you'll find in something like Microsoft Visual Studio, but it's all in your browser. And what I find amazing about it is it also gives you, I don't know if you can kind of see this blurry bit here, it will give you a full Linux virtual machine behind this thing with a bash shell or whatever shell you want to run. And it's about equivalent to a Raspberry Pi. Like I think it's like about the same amount of RAM, the same amount of CPU speed. Might be actually what they're running. Could, it could be. <laughs> Interestingly, the BeagleZone has this built into. Oh, yeah? yeah? That's really cool. I, I just want to get a BeagleZone. Is the BeagleZone's in there? Uh, I think they're from Seattle upstairs. Are they? Oh. Yeah, yeah. Check that out. Oh, I thought you meant. Yeah, be, 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 this is built into BeagleZone. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's also a Beagle Micro Center, too. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, I think this thing is really cool because you don't have to install anything on your computer. And the thing I've seen people do with this to kind of play into the theme of hobby computer and cloud. 
this grabs your code from GitHub. So that file system is actually a project from GitHub. Um, it can trigger tests in Travis, and it can also deploy to Heroku. And what I've seen some people do is, like, say you don't have a, a MacBook Pro or a Lenovo ThinkPad or whatever, so you just have a tablet, a keyboard cover. You can do some fairly serious development with a relatively weak tablet with internet access because you can get to this and you can get to all your virtual machines and resources in the cloud and that's your dev machine is all online. So I think this is kind of cool. What's its cost and everything? I think, uh, I want to say it goes up to about $5 a month is the lowest first tier. And it's basically incrementally improving the virtual machine behind the tool. So I think if you pay, uh, yeah, I thought I had the pricing written down, but there is like a sliding scale of pricing where you get a bigger and bigger virtual machine that backs the thing. And that lets you. IDE. What's that? How good is the IDE? Can you get auto completion, tab completion, things Yeah, it does uh, tab completion, does auto complete. I don't think it does like. Uh, it doesn't do like a telesense, sense. Like it doesn't do that like contextual help thing that you'll get from Visual Studio. Um, it does syntax highlighting because you can see the different colors. But I think it's like it's just barely crossed the point of hey, me, a text editor in the web. To oh, I can actually do some work with this. So it's not as good as a full out Visual Studio install, but it's surprisingly good for a, a web browser based environment. What kind of compiler support do they have? I think. Basically anything that you can run on Linux. So I think you might, you probably won't be able to do things like uh, C sharp in it, unless you're running like Mono or something like that. But you can do like Java. You do yeah, you can do Java. You could do C, C plus plus, Python, Python, Node, all that fun stuff. Um, yeah, so that's Cloud Nine. And again, kind of like my drumbeat of of analyzing these things. I like it because it's freezing beer. It's kind of like a free Raspberry Cloud in the sky. So oh, is there is a free version. There is a free version. Okay, because when I asked the cost, you said. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, my assumption in that is that there is a free version, and then you can upgrade from that. So the free version is basically a Raspberry Pi in the sky, and then once you outstrip that, you still have access to the IDE though. Yes. Okay. So the IDE is always free. It's just the hardware that you're running right. the stuff on. Works with everything else I mentioned so far. Works with GitHub and Travis and Heroku. Your code works everywhere else. The only downside, like I said, the Linux machine is very tiny. And do they have support for cross compilers and things like that? So can you compile a Raspberry by C++ code to cloud without having to compile it on your actual Raspberry? I would say, yeah, it should because if you if you get the uh, large enough virtual machine, you could install the cross compilers in that virtual machine. So it's, a, it's probably it takes a bit of manual setup, but I think you could just, it's just a straight up uh, Ubuntu install. Okay. So if you know what packages to install for cross compiling, I think you just go ahead and do that. Um, I think I may need to sprint through the rest of this thing, which is fine. Yeah, so anyways, this is the story so far. Things that I really like about these four services I talked about. Freeze and beer, you can usually pay for better support. They work well with other services that are not from the same company, and you can take your stuff with you. So in terms of a hobby computer constructed in the cloud, this is what I think of as good. Um, and, um, to the pay support, paid support thing in a second, I think that's kind of important. Because free is really good, because it means I get to use it. But I like services that you have the option to pay for, because then at least I know someone's paying for them, and they're not going to just finish it. So now I'm going to try to go through some of the services I've used that I don't like. So is anyone familiar with Google App Engine? Or there is it. Okay. Google App Engine is quite a lot like Heroku. They give you these kind of abstracted computing resources that you can throw your app onto. Um, what's not so great about it, so it is free as a beer. So there's a free tier like Heroku. That's great for hobbyists. <coughs> But it's a self-contained silo of services. And what I mean by that is Heroku lets you use a lot of the same things everyone else is using. 
So it lets you use oh, Node.js or Python, it lets you use MySQL, it lets you use uh, MongoDB. Google App Engine offers you a set of services that are inspired or derived from things Google uses. Which in one sense, that's cool. You get to use the same kinds of things they use to scale Google itself. But a lot of them don't look like anything else anywhere. So you use their data storage system. You have to use their libraries. You have to use, follow their patterns. You have to structure your data in their way. And I don't like that for hobby or work because I'm not learning something I can necessarily transfer to any other thing. Your code only works on that service because you've coded against their technology. So you can not You can probably fix it, you can't really pick it up and take it to another provider if you wanted to. And there's only, there are a few open source alternatives. I think people over the years have tried to clone it in their own versions, but there are only a few open source alternatives. And if you're looking for an open source alternative to everything Google uses, you might as well try something else that's a little less exotic, something that's a little more tried that people are using their services. So, next one I want to look at, Google Docs. Google Docs is pretty cool. I'm using it right now in a hobby sense for, uh, is there anyone in here that plays EVE Online? So it's the, the game of internet spaceships and hypercapitalism in the future. One of the things you can do in the game is you can play the market to make money, which is basically an advanced version of buy low, sell high. And I use Google Docs to help me figure out profit and loss in this game. Um, and one of the things that's cool about it is, you can't read that at the top, but one of the neat things about their spreadsheets, and you can do this in Excel also, you can make cell formulas that consult the internet for the contents. So you can go out to a cloud service, and I can pull in the current market prices for different items in the game. And that lets me build a spreadsheet. And it lets me do that for each charge. So cool, it's part of my hobby cloud computing arsenal. What's not so cool is that there isn't really another spreadsheet that's exactly like this. I can't export this spreadsheet and pull it into Excel and have it just work. Like there are similar capabilities, but the functions are different. And so there's just kind of like, it's not easy to just pick this up and move it to another provider. Have you tried the uh, Office Web Apps? Uh, no. Give them a try. I think that, the, but I think I would still have the problem of, I don't know, I should try it. My assumption is that this wouldn't convert directly over, but I haven't tried it, so I could be wrong. They're pretty, unless you have something really esoteric, you shouldn't have any problems because the formatting and everything pretty much stays the same. Okay, you have to check that out. Because that's the main thing is there are like, these are fairly... The Excel web app is pretty good. The word, yeah. the word, for, the word is kind of sucks. So yeah, so like I said, Freeze and Beer works with almost any web service because I can query almost anything on the web from this thing. My spreadsheets are fairly locked in unless I can convert it to another service. And Google Docs is ad supported, but to be fair, there is a paid apps for work tier that you can get into. So, but it's also I think like ten bucks a month, which is I'm too cheap to pay for these spreadsheets. So it's out of my running for hobby resources. Um, has anyone heard of If This Then That? No. So this is a cool service. I've got kind of an octopus diagram here. I do. <laughs> Part of my hobby is mucking around with social media stuff, and one of the things that if this then that is good at is simple rules. So, is anyone a fan of uh, Delicious or the service Pinboard? So, I have probably I've got up to so Pinboard is a service for storing bookmarks to things on the web. It's a it's a cloud service for storing your bookmarks. It's also kind of a personal search engine. And so what I do is anything I find on Reddit or uh, uh, Tumblr or you can't see from the feeds. I've got a personal feed reader. So basically, all these social media sources, I have recipes, and if this then that, where like say I retweet or favorite a tweet, I upvote something on Reddit. I've got if this then that recipes that will catch that, grab the link out of whatever thing I liked, and then archive it in my pinboard. 
So my pin board is kind of a rolling accumulation of all the links I find everywhere. And so that's really cool because this is free. And it works with, you know, they, they, they have to code each individual service integration, but they're up to like, I think 155 or so. Uh, but of course, the downsides are, if, if, the, if this then that ever goes away, there's no export. <laughs> like my rules are locked into that thing. I can't export them. The best I could do is take a screenshot and maybe reconstitute them on some similar competitor. And there's no paid support option. As far as I can tell, they're trying to make money with apps. So you could buy an if this then that app for your phone that does something similar on your phone, which I haven't really found useful. But that makes me think, someday this is going to go away. So I'm not going to do anything with it that I'll cry about if it dies. So that's kind of my, I use this, but I'm not going to do anything that I actually want to have around in five years. Another service similar to it, has anyone used Yahoo Pipes? Yeah, we were just talking about that last like or the other night. Pipes is cool. Um, I know the popularity of like RSS feeds have kind of waned a bit, but one of the cool things that this does is this is basically a processing pipeline for RSS feeds. Like here, you can't read this, but I wrote a pipeline that takes a Daring Fireball feed, which is this blogger that writes a lot about Apple and Google and tech. And I got tired of hearing all this stuff about Apple and Google, so I wrote some rules to take his feed, block all the stuff that mentioned Apple, Google, iPhone, all that, and now I just get his offbeat tech stories through this feed. And you can do some pretty complex things. Like you can build up all these blocks and wire them all together. And you get some pretty interesting feed remixes. Uh, but then the other night when I was kind of, I don't know if you can read that, but I was kind of doing research for this. And I asked, like, eh, you probably can't read that either. But Yahoo Pipes came out in 2006. And Yahoo's kind of notorious for just shutting things down, like GeoCities and delicious nice things. This started around the time they purchased a lot of those, and for some reason it's still going. And I don't know why. They just keep using it. In fact, the, one of the answers I got on, or one of the, the responses I got on Twitter was from the original product manager, who is like three jobs away from Yahoo now. Just like, shh, shut up, don't let them know it's still there. We're all still using it. <laughs> So yeah, so Yahoo Pipes, Freeze and Beer, works with any RSS feed. I cannot export those pipes ever. So if I spend a whole weekend perfecting my pipeline for all my favorite tech feeds, it's basically work poured into a Roach Motel. I can't get that stuff out. And there's no paid support option. I don't know, there's no service around this. It's just, I don't even know what they ever thought they were going to do with it in terms of funding. But apparently it's still working no one remembered to shut it down. <laughs> so in terms of the sort of logical connections like if this then that and you know, pipes and so on. Yeah. Is there any work being done toward standardizing that so that multiple people could be doing the same thing and could work as you so I just wondered if you heard anything. There I think there have been lots of efforts and none of them have taken off. Or they've taken off and there is a I think it was an XKCD cartoon that was like, we need to standardize this. <laughs> oh great, now you have three, sta like, <laughs> there's two different inter uninteroperable things, let's do a standard, now you have three. I think that's what's basically done, is there's a, probably a few dozen different ways to layer these things together. And some of them work with others, and there's adapters for some of them. But really the, the, the common thing between all of them at least is um, HTTP, because they are all web services. So you've at least got that level of So this is the last service, which is just in time because I'm out of time. And really the main thing I want to say about Yahoo, about Amazon Web Services, is this is kind of the Uber cloud hobby machine. If you haven't signed up for Amazon Web Services before, you get a, a access to a free tier for a year. And uh, you can do quite a lot with that. So like this is a dial-up BBS. That takes me back. And this I ran on a free uh, a free tier virtual machine because I didn't I couldn't be bothered to dig up the hardware to run the right version of DOS and Windows to get it to work. 
And it turns out that I found one that runs on Windows 2000, and it just so happens that Amazon has stock machines you can just pull off their virtual shelf and I can throw this PBS on it. Um, and I also run my blog on Amazon S3. So using GitHub and Travis and all that stuff, I write posts in Git, push them into Git, and they go through Travis, and Travis automatically pushes them into this web hosting service that Amazon has. And it's not free, but I've never paid more than uh, 25 cents a month to post my blog. So that's pretty cool. And so with barely any time to spare that is what I want to say about cloud services. <laughs> any question that I haven't already answered? I think so. Cool.